Okay, we have covered the uh, acute transient, acute transient, and uh, chronic uh, latent uh, viruses. Let's talk about the regular old chronic viruses. And the best example of that is in our uh, discussion of chronic hepatitis. So the word chronic viral infections is almost synonymous with the various hepatitises or hepatitides, if you will. Uh, we're up to about uh, six of them now, A, B, C, D, E. A, B, and C are the most common ones and the ones of most concern for you. And uh, they're all chronic infections. They all have acute phases. And uh, we'll be talking about them more in the GI chapter. But uh, if you just kind of remember, A is the mildest, the most common. I think it approaches 100% uh, prevalence in underdeveloped uh, nations. B, uh, the so-called uh, serum hepatitis uh, is probably the single uh, most serious common type of hepatitis in the uh, acute phase, the most serious. And of course, hepatitis C, uh, probably the most common cause of persistent transaminitis or elevation of AST and ALT uh, in adults in the United States. Uh, Let's uh, talk about chronic viruses behavior in general and use he uh, hepatitis as the example. Uh, here is a normal liver. I hope you remember this from the histology series. And as you kind of remember, the blood flows from the portal vein to the central vein through these sinusoids. Uh, and that is the overall direction of flow in the liver. So the, the concept is, if you have a toxic substance coming from the central vein here, which is surrounded by the portal triad, towards the central vein, which of course is surrounded by nothing, uh, the first part of the liver lobule to be involved with pathogens or toxins is number one, what they call the periportal zone. And then as you go towards number two and number three, the exposure gets less and less. So the point I want to make is that toxins and pathogens are more likely to cause changes in the periportal part of the liver lobule. Now let's say that the primary process is ischemia or lack of oxygen. Well, because this is the first part of the liver to get the blood flow, this would get more relative oxygen than the central lobular area. So the general principle for all hepatic diseases is summarized by the fact that toxic substances produce changes in the periportal area and ischemic changes produce changes like necrosis in the central lobular area. So it's no surprise that chronic hepatitis basically starts out uh, in an acute phase, but uh, as seen in the chronic phase, would have a infiltration of lymphocytes, chronic inflammatory cells, macrophages, in the uh, portal triad area. And the amount of damage or a spread from this uh, infiltrate determines the amount or severity of the disease. Here's a, an acute picture of hepatitis in which we see councilman bodies, which used to be thought of as being the diagnostic features of acute hepatitis B. Uh, actually, all they are are individual uh, hepatocytes that have uh, are undergoing apoptosis. Okay, let's talk about our fourth and last general clinical group of viral infections. We talked about the acute transient. We talked about the latent, chronic latent. We talked about the general chronic. And let's give an example now of the two most common transforming groups of viral infections. And of course, in humans, that would be the EB virus or Epstein-Barr virus and the HPV, human papillomaviruses. And both of these are viruses which can cause affection, infections, uh, in acute uh, infections of various types, but they are also indicted in the development of many, many human malignancies. Let's start out with EBV. This is a virus that causes a type of lymphoma known as Burkitt's lymphoma. But guess what? It also causes infectious mononucleosis, the same virus. In mononucleosis, we have a pharyngitis, uh, lymphadenopathy, 
splenic enlargement, you know, liver damage. And of course, the diagnostic, uh, most common diagnostic serologic test is the presence of heterophile antibodies. You have to have a very severe pharyngitis to have mono. And of course, the reason why it's called mono is because the lymphocytes are also involved and infected, and they take on atypical features. In other words, this classical looking lymphocyte here looks a little bit more like a monocyte now because the nucleus has gotten larger and a little more irregular. And that's probably why it's called mono. And a lot of people mistakenly think that monocytes are elevated in mononucleosis. Uh -uh, that's wrong. It's actually lymphocytes that look atypical uh, and are called monocytes that are the cells seen in the peripheral sphere of infectious mononucleosis. And if you can agree that this virus imparts some atypia to the nucleus, uh, perhaps uh, in the same type of way it makes the lymphocytes of Burkitt's lymphomas malignant, then you can understand what's going on here. By the same token, let's look at a s malignant cell of a squamous cell carcinoma. I don't think I have any problem convincing you that these are malignant squamous cells. They're big, dark, dark, hyperchromatic, pleomorphic. They're as malignant as hell. Uh, and they're malignant because they have been transformed by forces <coughs> which has been spearheaded by HPV. And as you probably know, if you, know, you have taken the vaccine or uh, encourage your children to take the vaccine, it's basically type 16 and 18, but there's a whole bunch of types of HPV, and they're responsible for a whole multitude of squamous malignancies and squamous benign proliferations of uh, any squamous mucosa, whether it's cervix, whether it's uh, vaginal, whether it's oral, whether it's skin. HPV loves to cause skin tumors. Okay. We're done with viruses, let's get into the bacteria. And we've already seen the slide. We talked about the general classification of bacterial infections being gram positive, primarily cocci, being gram negative, primarily bacilli, but you know there's exceptions for each group. Then the groups that don't stain, like the mycobacteria having to use a special zeal Nielsen or acid fast stain rather than the gram stain. The spirochetes, which do not stain at all, and have a hard time growing out, being cultured. Uh, the anaerobes, which can stain either gram-positive or gram-negative, usually, most commonly, gram-positive rods. And then this family of obligate intracellular bacteria, which uh, can't be cultured and are not really bacteria, at least not classically. So here we go, gram-positive cocci, uh, staph and strep, probably almost synonymous with the term gram-positive cocci, can cause infections anywhere, literally anywhere, skin and upper lower respiratory tract uh, most commonly. Uh, staph, of course, has been indicted and as the cause of toxic shock syndrome, releasing super antigens. It's a, a common cause of both lower or lung respiratory infections as well as uppers, the most common cause in wound and skin infections, causing a type of disease with strep called impetigo, a very common cause of inflammation of the hair follicles, perhaps secondary to uh, acne or other localized uh, follicular eruptions, being a common, the most common cause of endocarditis in drug users, and of course it's toxins representing a very common type of food poisoning as well. Uh, I think that's what we'll, we'll call it a, a stopping for now, and then we'll start our next group with uh, the other gram-positive caucus uh, strep. Thank you very much.